Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. In Sudan, President Bashir has said it's a time of reckoning with South Sudan, the newly formed country. Juba is its capital. He says either South Sudan will take Khartoum and control all of Sudan, or the other way around. Bashir says he will take South Sudan, where most of the oil now is. And of course, that's what, in the final analysis, most of the conflict in Sudan is about. Oil. Now joining us to talk about this is Ni Akuate. He's an independent analyst of African and international affairs. He writes uh, regularly on Pambazuka News, and he's a former executive director of Africa Action, and he was a professor of African studies at Georgetown University. Thanks very much for joining us, Ni. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So be before we get into the specifics of what's happening now, these threats and the, what seems to be a uh, intensification and possible open all-out warfare between North and South Sudan. For, give us some basic context, some historical context of how we got here. Yes, you know, Sudan, um, um, South Sudan, the, the smaller of the two countries in the conflict, became independent uh, just a, a, a few months ago. In fact, it's uh, designated as the youngest country in the world. It broke off from uh, Sudan. So this is a sort of a divorce, a bitter divorce. The quarrels leading to the divorce have been a very long way in coming. Sudan actually got in its independence from Britain and Egypt uh, in 1958, but the quarrel between the North and the South actually predates independence. Before independence, the Southerners agitating, in fact, Southerners in the National Army broke out in revolt in some camps before independence. So there's been a big quarrel. What has the quarrel been about? Number one, uh, one of the reasons is um, just cultural differences. The North is largely, quote, Arab and Muslim. The South is, quote, African, black African and non-Muslim, some Christian, some indigenous religions. And the capital, Khartoum, it has always maintained power. It has marginalized the South. Incidentally, it has marginalized other peripheries too, such as Western Sudan, which most Americans will remember as Darfur. So Sudan is a big country that where different groups felt marginalized and repressed, and the South particularly so, and they have been fighting the North for a long time. Eventually, uh, in the last 10 years or so, the world got very concerned, came up with what is known as the CPA, Comprehensive Peace Agreement, and under the agreement, it was agreed that the South will vote to see whether it wanted to secede or not. They did have that vote a year and a half ago, and 90% uh, of the voters uh, uh, chose to secede, so they peacefully seceded. The problem we have now, as you rightly said, is being aggravated by the fact that Sudan is a big oil-producing country now. Most of the oil is in the south. So now that they've split into two countries, about 75% of the oil fields are in the south, but the outlet for selling the oil internationally, the pipelines go through the north to Port Said, which is on the sea of, uh, of uh, North Sudan. So these two countries, hostile to each other, are stuck over oil, transporting the oil, but there is also the issue of the where the proper borders have to be drawn. There is also the issue of ethnicity, and there is the issue also of each of the two countries sponsoring dissidents and fighters in each other's country. Now, in theory, at least, a deal is there to be had because the South needs the North to, for its refineries and infrastructure for shipping the oil out. They could come to some kind of revenue split. Some people even talked about a 50-50 split. So it's not like inherently there has to be this conflict over who's going to control South Sudan's oil. On the other hand, the conflict continues. And let's just add one more factor to this which is most of the oil, if I understand it correctly, produced in South Sudan is being done by the Chinese. So you also have that ingredient. And then, of course, U.S. foreign policy here, which would like to topple Bashir in the north and is financing, if I understand it correctly, a lot of the army of South Sudan and is fully backing South Sudan. So that's a, a complicated, volatile mix. It absolutely is. And in fact, uh, before independence, some of us actually expect that um, uh, China 
will, will uh, put all its weight behind uh, uh, North Sudan. Uh, I'm, I'm saying not just to distinguish it from the South, but officially it is Sudan. The surprise, the pleasant surprise, is that China has actually not shunned the South. It has also started wooing the, the South. So if there is going to be a broker who both sides might listen to, it might be China. As you rightly said, the United States and the West have been behind the South for a, a long time. So they are not seen as uh, being able to talk to both sides. Incidentally, they have indicted Omar Bashir in the north, and therefore it's unlikely that he's going to listen to them. Um, they've been putting pressure on a lot of countries to arrest Omar Bashir, but the countries have not. So I think in all this, I'm looking to see what the Chinese are saying. And I think you are right. The two countries have to live with each other forever. And in terms of the oil, they have to have a deal uh, for, for a while, and actually there is a deal on the table with some uh, disputes over how much is to be paid. I think that this recent flare-up, the, the obstacle has been, of course, as everywhere, it's been the politicians and the generals who are running the country, but most of the ordinary people there, I think, will very much like to have disputes resolved peacefully so that the oil can flow and the revenues can be used to improve their lives. Why is the United States so uh, antagonistic towards Bashir. I mean, he's, Bashir's been playing ball with the IMF, if I understand it correctly. He follows IMF guidelines. I, I mean, it's not like the U.S. has problem dealing with dictators. It's just they don't like dictators that don't play ball. But to some extent, Bashir does play ball. He played ball a little bit, but, um, you know, Darfur, I'm sure that many of the uh, uh, people watching might remember Darfur from a few years back, which was a big issue in the administration of uh, uh, George W. Bush. I, I think that during that time, the dominant narrative was that uh, Khartoum and Bashir was brutalizing. I mean, we have been talking about uh, things done to the South, but he was brutalizing people in the West, which is called Darfur. And it was from there, the indictment, the ICC indictment, is based on atrocities committed in Darfur. And this was the time when I was actually running uh, Africa Russian here in Washington. So Darfur was a number one issue for us. So part of the Western animosity towards Omar Bashir is number one over what he did in Darfur. It is also because until now he's been a very close uh, friend of the Chinese. And um, also, you are right, the U.S. has bought so many dictators across Africa. They used to actually Sudan when it was being run by uh, Numairi, another general who took power before Bashir, he was America's best friend. But then uh, Bashir and others who followed Numairi made a hard turn towards Islam because to keep power, they wrapped themselves in, in a Muslim religious rhetoric and tried to uh, politicize uh, Islam. So that is also another part. Of course, it's very complicated because one other thing I need to throw in is for all of George Bush's rhetoric about Sudan being terrible and committing atrocities in, in Darfur, under the table, he was working with them in, in Iraq because apparently they had a joint program to infiltrate the, the uh, insurgents in Iraq. And therefore, Bush's administration was, while it was talking tough talk publicly, was cooperating behind the scenes with some of Bashir's uh, generals who had committed atrocities. We know that at least one was flown to the CIA to come in um, and advise them and give them intelligence. Well, we saw the same thing where uh, the Bush administration worked with Assad in Syria, Gaddafi in Libya, and they were all cooperating on this supposed war on terror. But let, let's go a little further. The, uh, so uh, this kind of talk we're hearing from Bashir now, uh, you, you know, saying he's either going to conquer the South or the South is going to conquer the North, and it's an all-out war. I mean, is this bluster, or are we on the precipice of all-out war? I think it is largely bluster. I will say 70% bluster. But the reason I will not, and, 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 and my reason is that uh, Bashir has 
a long record of, of, of this kind of bluster and talking tough and saying all out war and saying, I have given the order for the troops to go to war, but they, but they haven't done so. I mean, I remember last fall, we had such a situation where you had just come back from China and was saying, it's all out war. I don't want to talk to the staff. But, but we didn't get that kind of all out attack. On the other hand, I don't want to say that we can completely dismiss it because number one, he has a, a strong, big army. Number two, in the last, uh, uh, the most recent flare-up, it was actually the South. Based on all the news accounts we can get, that was the aggressor. They crossed the recognized lines and took the uh, oil field of Hedlick. But now they've been forced to give it back. And Bashir was, in fact, his statement was in that oil field, Heglik, which is right on the border, and he's saying now he will fight. I, I believe that he does most of that talk for domestic uh, 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 consumption because he has a hard time. Sudan is huge. There is a lot of different groups that are not happy. So to hold them together, he's talking tough and, and pushing war. It is a lot of bluster, but I would not dismiss it, all of it, because in the cauldron that we have on the border, a little mistake can lead to a lot of war. And, Moreover, and, what's, and what's, the, what's the U.S. interest here? Because some people have suggested that the U.S. would like to destabilize the situation, one, hoping Bashir falls as a result of it, and two, maybe eventually the Chinese get muscled out as well, and then you have a kind of pro-Western South Sudan take control of it all. Um, I mean, do you see evidence of that? Well, in terms of the goals, I can share, I mean, I can believe that. I can share that hypothesis that U.S. goals will, be, will love to get rid of Bashir and get some uh, more compliant person in Khartoum, and that they definitely would like it if were the big uh, uh, recipient of the oil instead of the Chinese. So I think those go, two goals sound credible to me. I'm not willing to go as far as say that it is in U.S. interest to destabilize the area, because I think the, the other thing that is important to the U.S. is to build up South Sudan as a strong, uh, uh, self-reliant, rich country, because it has a lot of oil. Uh, the U.S. has a number of dictators in the region that are its friends, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda, and even the Kenyans. So it will like, I think, that a war, if it comes, and this is part of why Bashir is blustering so much, he has more muscle than South Sudan. South Sudan is young, and even though it has oil resources, it cannot exploit it fully right now, so it's fairly weak. So it doesn't sound credible or smart to me that the Obama administration's policy will be to destabilize the area, because if they do, the country that they support, South Sudan, is likely to lose that war. So I think they will want to use other measures. If anything, they wouldn't want to stir up war until uh, South Sudan is stronger. In fact, I think, as I said, President Obama has been quite um, uh, measured since the recent flare-up. My reading is that it's because the backers, the Western backers of South Sudan are chagrined, and they don't like it that South Sudan went and took Hegli because they feel like it's not yet ready. It doesn't have the military. Hegli is this oil town right on the disputed border with North and South, and the South took it. And, and if I understand correctly, Bashir has now either pushed them out or they withdrew. Yes, yes. Um, you know, you, actually, you are right. We've had both versions. The South said, oh, we withdrew because Obama and others and the Security Council told us to withdraw. But uh, Bashir says, no, they did not withdraw. We kicked them out, and we are going to go all the way to the capital, Juba. All right. Well, we'll come back and discuss this further as, as, as events unfold. And viewers, I suggest please send questions for me that we can ask him next time we talk about this. And we'll try to come back and, and, and dig further into the situation in Sudan in the, in the next week or so. Thanks very much for joining us, Ni. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.